the Autism Research Institute relies on the generosity of donors like you to make this webcast possible. If you enjoy this presentation, please consider making a donation. Thank you. Now, before we get started, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dana Lakey is a licensed nutritionist providing preventative and therapeutic medical nutrition services in Kensington, Maryland. Her practice encompasses the full spectrum of complex health issues in all ages, including children with special needs, ADHD, and autism. In addition to media presentations, writing, radio talk show hosting, and providing professional continuing education courses, Dana has been a Maryland Legislative Assistant on Health Issues and has served four gubernatorial appointments on two state health care regulatory boards. She is co-author of the Kid-Friendly ADHD and Autism Cookbook, The Ultimate Guide to the Gluten-Free, Casein-Free Diet, and the ADHD and Autism Nutritional Supplement Handbook. You can type your questions into the questions section starting now and throughout the talk. These webinars are made possible through generous donor support. If you would like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.com. And now I will turn it over to Dana. Welcome, and it's nice to be here. I have a lot of material to cover. I hope that it's helpful, and we will save time at the end to answer some questions. Okay, so the digestive tract, this is the basics, and it's important to grasp this because it will apply to everything we talk about afterwards. The oral cavity, you have chewing and salivary enzymes. A lot of people don't realize there's a little bit of digestion that begins in the mouth. The food passes through the esophagus to the stomach where hydrochloric acid is released to break down food to chyme. At the end of the stomach in the duodenum, the pancreas then releases digestive enzymes and alkalizers for digestion in the small intestine. And this is where 90% of food digestion and nutrient absorption occur. In the colon, water is reabsorbed from the stool, which exits through the anus. And when we look at this graphic, the stomach begins this process. Now, we have peristalsis, we'll look at that, going on. Peristalsis is the involuntary constriction and relaxation of the muscles of the digestive tract, and it creates a wave-like set of movements that push the food through the digestive tract where digestion occurs until stool elimination through the anus. Now, disturbances in peristalsis can lead to digestive problems, including constipation. It often begins in the stomach. So if we have gastroparesis, which is a slowdown of the stomach digesting. So food sits there, it ferments, it, um, it doesn't move, the person feels full, and it slows down, the, the entire system is slowed down. And this frequently happens with low tone. Individuals who have low, mu low muscle tone can also have low tone in the gut. So it's important to remember that. Now, here's the Bristol stool chart, and it's available online. And as you can see, I noted with two red arrows that very constipated and slightly constipated. So... In constipation, the stool is usually very dry, difficult to eliminate, and let's go through the symptoms of constipation. Infrequent bowel movements. The ideal is one to three easy to eliminate form stools per day. Straining to have a bowel movement, hard, dried, or small feces, a sense of incomplete evacuation after a bowel movement, lower abdominal discomfort, bloating and or gas, abdominal distension, anal bleeding or fissures due to trauma from hard feces, occasional diarrhea, which can come from stool leaking around an obstruction. And so the person gets the idea 
that regular stooling is occurring, but the obstruction gets larger and larger, and what is happening is this stool leaking around the obstruction. Feeling too full to eat is a common symptom of constipation and irritability and behavior changes. Now, in autism, we may, we may see all of those that we talked about, but we often see this chronic abdominal distension and posturing where a child or an adult will apply pressure on the abdomen with hands or leaning over an armchair or table. This pressure helps stimulate a bowel movement. And I find that the children figure this out. I mean, this is something that they've developed on their own. No one teaches them to do it. It just makes them feel more comfortable when they can stimulate a bowel movement. And squatting to eliminate on the toilet or elsewhere, children naturally get into this position. And this is an important position. So let's talk about constipation and autism. And I mentioned the first three. Withholding elimination, especially if bowel movements have been painful. Stool leakage due to an impaired neural signaling and possible blockage. Regression in ASD symptoms, irritability, and in more severe cases, self-injury. So when a child is constipated, you may not know it as a parent. But the child's irritability and decline is very, very apparent. And it is very important to get to a GI doctor, have your pediatrician or physician make a referral. Now, constipation, basic contributors. I'm going to start with the simplest. Everyone knows that dehydration, the lack of adequate water fluid intake, this slows down the colon, causing dry, hard stools and fewer bowel movement. Poor posture in elimination. Squatting is more successful. So when we use the toilet in the regular way, we're really causing problems with elimination. Now, more about basic contributors. Low fiber diet, but not for all conditions. Food reactions, especially to gluten and cow milk products. Inactivity and a sedentary lifestyle, stress. Calcium supplementation without magnesium. And iron. These two supplements can be quite constipating. Iron, especially if it's a ferrous sulfate form. The medications that can contribute to constipation include antacids, either calcium antacids or aluminum antacids, opioids, and antidepressants, anticonvulsants can, calcium channel blockers can, and chronic use of stimulant laxatives like senna or castor oil. And withholding bowel movements dulls the signal to eliminate eventually. And this withholding occurs because elimination has been painful. And this is not uncommon in the autism community. So some of the constipation complex contributors. And these are, these are true medical conditions that warrant uh, immediate attention. And any time you suspect a blockage, any time a bowel movement has not been produced within three days, you should be paying active attention and seeking medical help. Now, some people will say, oh, if you have one bowel movement a week, that's okay. But it really isn't. And it, it we reabsorb toxins that are fermenting. Uh, in the gut. It's just unhealthy. So an underactive thyroid gland will slow the whole system down, and that includes the gut. So we get constipation, we get a sluggish brain and a sluggish bowel. Impaired GI nerve signaling. This can be innate or due to chronic diabetes, and this is something we can see in the autism community. Low muscle tone in the GI tract, and I mentioned this earlier, 
if someone has low muscle tone, the GI tract muscles can also be affected. This impedes or slows down the peristalsis, which we described in the beginning. There are digestive disorders that are complex contributors to constipation. Celiac disease, most associated with diarrhea, but early on, it can be associated with constipation. Irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's are examples. Autism-related enterocolitis, this is a specific type of inflammatory bowel disease that is specifically found in those with autism. So that's why it's called autism-related enterocolitis. GI infections can lead to diarrhea, but they can lead to constipation. Redundant colon, and that can lead to the sigmoid colon twisting, and it's called volvulus, and it can be very, very dangerous. It can strangulate and create a, a block or an obstruction. Megacolon, and this is where the colon is dilated or enlarged, and peristaltic, peristaltic paralysis occurs. So what that means is the colon has gotten enlarged. Often it's because of a withholding stool that stretches the colon. There can be um, other idiopathic, meaning we don't know the pathology, idiopathic causes as well. There can be blockages from hard stool impactions or twisting of the colon. Gastroparesis, which is delayed gastric emptying, which I mentioned in the beginning. When that happens, when the stomach doesn't digest and well and move the chyme on to the small intestine, we're in trouble and the whole system will be slowed down. And this is part of motility disorders where we have poor or reduced peristalsis. And it's important to see the physician for any chronic or acute GI problem. Now, these are the constipation strategies that we're going to talk about. Uh, drinking water and other healthy liquids, squatting posture to eliminate probiotics and biotin for good microbiota support, digestive enzymes, and we'll go into supplements. And I mentioned avoiding calcium and iron. We'll include the following supplements that are helpful, magnesium, vitamin C, choline, L-carnitine, B vitamins, digestive enzymes, aloe vera juice, and we'll talk about the importance of a healthy diet, nutrient-dense foods, organic. And we'll talk about some of the elimination diets uh, and dietary fiber. And there's a caution in functional bowel diseases with regard to fiber. So these are the items we're going to cover. Now, water liquid intake, mineral water from spring waters or artesian water, contain at least 250 parts per million of dissolved solids, minerals, and trace elements. It's called, known as hard water. And magnesium in the mineral water has a laxative effect. The sulfate content, content uh, for instance, the magnesium sulfate, increases weight and consistency of the stools. That prevents diarrhea. So you've got two, uh, two parts of this 250 parts per million of dissolved solids, magnesium and sulfate. There are many other mi minerals as well. Now, water f that is filtered to remove fluoride, chlorine, toxins, and contaminants is very important. And this is a very complex issue that we could spend an entire hour on. I invite you to go to the Environmental Working Group filter information, and I put the link, filters should be certified by the California Department of Public Health and or NSF. And I put in here, avoid distilled water. It's empty water. It's kind of like empty calories. It's empty water. It doesn't have nutrients in it. And we try to have our patients avoid that. Now, strategies, a little bit more detail on water and liquid intake. Other liquids to include broths, coconut water, almond milk, hemp milk, 
dilute fruit juices and 10% juice, 90% water. This, uh, some people, individuals do not like to drink water. Some actually feel nauseous when they drink water alone. Adding a little solute to it can make a difference. Vegetable juices, decaffeinated tea and decaffeinated coffee, organic. Seltzer water can be used. An interesting phenomenon about seltzer water is that the bubbles make people feel satisfied and they may not drink as much. Smoothies, vegetable and fruit, and avoid the following. All sodas and soft drinks, high in phosphorus. These are all high in phosphorus. They are electrolyte antagonists. They are diuretics. They're pulling these good minerals out of the body. Alcohol is extremely dehydrating. High moisture foods contribute vegetables, fruits. Low moisture foods do not. Meats, eggs, beans, nuts, and seeds. Now, I've just included this for you to look at, and these, this is the water consumption and recommendations. We tell adults to get at least half the body weight in ounces of water. Half the body weight in ounces of water. And then the strategies, squat, don't sit. You can see the use of a stool here, and this is the toddler's position when they want to play and when they have a bowel movement, if they have a diaper on, this is the position they get into. And what that does is it's the anorectal angle that needs to be straight, and that occurs with squatting. It does not with sitting. Now, supplement safety, because we're going to talk about this. They're regulated by the body through homeostasis, by natural adjustments in absorption and retention. So when you have higher needs, you absorb and retain more. When you have lower needs, you absorb and retain less. They are regulated by the FDA as a food. They are well identified by the body. It's the body's language. And I just compare here adverse event reports on pharmaceuticals and nutritional supplements. You can see it's pretty extreme. And supplement safety, annual causes of death, over 190,000 a year from all pharmaceuticals and from nutritional supplements, zero to 10 uh, per year. And that's, uh, by the way, when children eat mom's iron pills and think they're little candies. And the principles, this is very important, so I won't repeat it when I talk about the supplements. Supplementation is customized to the patient's individual DRI, RDA, what the patient actually needs. The recommendations that are out are for, they meet the needs of 97 to 98% of healthy individuals. They do not apply at all to unhealthy individuals. And there's uh, the number of people or the percentage of people that are healthy are 24%, 76% being unhealthy. So you start low and go slow, introduce one new supplement at a time, at a lower dose, increases tolerated, stop if there are problems, add another supplement in one to five days, and the person should continue the supplement as long as there are no problems. Now let's look at the human microbiome. Very interesting. We have extremely low density. Look at this graph over here. This is actually from a stool test. And what we find out is that most Western culture individuals have 25% of the kinds of my microbiota they should have in the gut. And what that means is that we're inefficient and we get into trouble. Uh, there are 10 trillion human cells to 100 trillion microbiota and 100 times more bacterial genomes for each human genome. I find that amazing. And each one of us is unique in our microbiome. So let's look at probiotics and prebiotics. Prebiotics are the non-digestible complex fibers from fruits, legumes, vegetables, whole grains, and other fiber sources. And they serve as fuel for beneficial bacteria. But those who have digestive problems may not handle these complex fibers very well. And those on specific carbohydrate diet or GAPS, the prebiotics such as in, inulin may not be tolerated. And these individuals need SCD legal 
specific carbohydrate diet, legal probiotics. So let's look at the probiotics. They uh, come naturally from fermented foods, kefir, yogurt, sauerkraut, uh, vegetables. They provide trillions. The count is very high. The longer you ferment something, the higher the count. Now, 70% of human immunity is in that digestive tract fed by good flora. And the CFU is the number of colony forming units. And so in the formulas, you want to choose those specific for infants, children, or adults. And there are a blend of multiple species of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. In infants, the total should be 1 to 2 billion. It can be more. These are general recommendations. In children uh, that are toddlers to uh, not adolescents would be 10 to 20 billion, adults 25 to 100 billion. This is highly individualized. If you increase and there are lots of, uh, d there's lots of discomfort or gas, go back to the dose that worked and then try to increase later, and maybe you don't, you don't get a good result, you stay at the lower dose. And those people who have highly sensitive digestive tracts should start with SCD and GAPS legal lactobacillus acidophilus without fiber, inulin, or maltodextrin. 3 billion and 10 billion. They have two different dose levels. And we'll mention these diets. These diets are for individuals who have real intolerances to many, many foods. Now, biotin is a critical piece here. It specifically does not treat constipation. It's not specific. But what it does is it is manufactured by the microbiota and it stabilizes the digestive milieu. It is necessary to prevent pathogenic yeast overgrowth. In infants, we use 2 to 5 milligrams. In children, 5 to 10 milligrams. In adults, 10 to 20 milligrams. There is no toxic dose of biotin. Now, supplements based on findings and symptoms. These are the strategies for constipation. You want to increase probiotics to 25 to 100 billion. Biotin, you can increase. S. boulardi is a non-pathogenic yeast that is beneficial if there's yeast overgrowth. And biotin retards pathogenic yeast overgrowth. Now, S. boulardi improves bowel transit, and the dose is 1 to 6 billion. Rice-based medicinal formulas, they're medical formulas for children and adults, can be used. And digestive enzymes with demulcents, these heal, slippery elm, deglycerized licorice, marshmallow root. And some enzymes uh, have DPP4 DPP for opioid digestion for people who have problems with gluten and casein. It's important to start with a mild low dose of the enzymes. And we use very kind enzymes because in the GI tract that has problems, if we use strong enzymes, it can create discomfort, so we're careful. Other considerations, the fermented foods we mentioned before, and the diets. Look at this alphabet soup here. We will cover these, so uh, we'll, we'll go on with the supplements now. I put calcium here because if people are going off milk products, a common recommendation for people with GI problems, here are substitutes for calcium sources. But we don't want to add a lot of calcium from supplements. The calcium supplements tend to constipate and are best avoided until constipation is resolved. If supplementing, use calcium citrate at less than 500 milligrams per day. Do not take calcium without half as much or more magnesium. Excess calcium increases risk for inflammation and calcifications. Doses should not exceed the 500 milligrams per day. Now, magnesium is the most important mineral. Uh, if I had to recommend one mineral, it would be magnesium. It affects over 400 magnesium-dependent enzymes, affects mood, behavior, hyperactivity, perseverations, anxiety, fears, emotional constipation, 
Hyperreflexia, that's easy startle, aggressive, defiant, memory learning problems, poor endurance, yawning, sound and or light sensitivity, insomnia, nightmares, terrors, poor calcium, bone loss, and even seizures. This is most of these symptoms are the picture of what we see in the autism community. Now, I've put the sources and supplements and therapeutic ranges. Magnesium has a very low toxicity because if you take too much, you get diarrhea, which then depletes the magnesium. The least impact on the stool is magnesium glycinate, chelate, aspartate, or gluconate. Most stool effect is from magnesium citrate and chloride. And we use the magnesium citrate for constipation. Again, start low dose. Uh, the goal is one to three formed, easy to eliminate stools per day. Adults can take 125 to 150 milligrams one to three times a day or more. And the goal is to reach the stool elimination goal. Uh, so if if you've improved and uh, you or your child and there are stooling every other day instead of every three days, you still want to go until you get to this goal. Children can be 50 to 100 milligrams one to two times a day or more. Again, this is individualized based on each person's uniqueness. Now, vitamin C has a lot of important functions and there are deficiency symptoms associated with it that are important. But it's also very popular to use in constipation. And what we try to do is achieve the right dose. And the right dose achieves bowel tolerance and regular bowel movements. So if you take too much, you push yourself toward diarrhea. And the goal is, again, the form stools easy to eliminate. And it varies. When the immune system is depleted, more, cal more vitamin C is tolerated. When the immune system is more stable, less is tolerated. And choline, uh, choline becomes acetylcholine in the body. And this is a really important concept. It's important in bowel and brain health because acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter made in the bowel, made in the brain. There is a connection. The neurotransmitters in the bowel are also in the brain. And this folate-dependent, one-carbon metabolic process has been found to be altered in children with autism. The impact is a decline in cogni cognition and a slowdown in peristalsis and motility. So we have a sluggish brain, a sluggish bowel. Choline stimulates the peristalsis we talked about, increasing frequency and regularity of bowel movements. It can also increase cognition and language in autism. And there is a medication called bethanacol, which Mary Meggs and, uh, really made uh, important because it, it does this. It increases acetylcholine. And it's been very effective for a subset of those with autism. Now, dosing of phosphatidylcholine or GPC choline is 300 to 600 milligrams for a child, 1,200 to 1,800 milligrams for an adult. And again, start with the smallest dose because if you achieve, uh, if you achieve healthy bowel movements with a small dose, that's good. That's it. Excess dosing can lead to too frequent BMs and diarrhea. Now, L-carnitine is another one. It's important in energy production. It actually uses up glucose and gets rid of triglycerides, using them as energy. And deficiencies reduce gastrointestinal motility, leading to constipation. Carnitine improves tone in the intestines. It also pr improves tone in the muscles of a body. Use L-carnitine, not DL-carnitine or D-carnitine. This is an extremely important thing to remember. The L-carnitine dosing for the child, 250 milligrams a day or more. For the adult, 250 milligrams three times a day. There is a prescription form called Carnitor, and it is just pure L-carnitine. Either one of these can be used. L-carnitine supplementation is contraindicated in very specific carnitine disorders. And these are the kinds of tests that we are now doing on those 
with autism, and you would know that through your physician. Other nutritional strategies, aloe vera juice, whole leaf, organic, preservative-free. This is the form that helps with constipation. Anti, it's anti-inflammatory and healing, soothing for the GI tract. It supports healthy GI milieu and the microbiota. And start with one ounce a day, increasing to three times a day or more as tolerated. Now, a multiple vitamin mineral is very important because it has a baseline of nutrients that help different processes in the body. The B vitamins are important in here. The B vitamins are needed in energy metabolism, and that affects digestive health. Most people don't think about B vitamins and digestive health. Uh, select a baseline, high-quality, multiple vitamin mineral without iron and appropriate to age, stage, and gender. Avoid formulas that have iron and have more than 250 milligrams of calcium. Follow the dosing on the label. Now, dietary fiber, we have to have a caution here because in functional bowel diseases, we have to go low on fiber, and that includes colitis, motility disorders, gastroparesis, distension, blockages and obstructions, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, megacolon, and redundant colon. Insoluble roughage adds bulk to the stool, and this can be particularly problematic in people with the functional bowel diseases and it comes from brands, beans, lentils, whole grains, seeds, and vegetables. Soluble fiber attracts water, becomes a gel, and it too can become a problem, especially if motility is delayed and, and motility problems are a factor. And it's found in oat bran, barley nuts, seeds, beans, lentil seeds, and guar gum, fruits and vegetables. Consider prunes if tolerated. They contain sorbitol and natural sugar alcohol, which draws water into the intestines and helps alleviate constipation. Some additional strategies, acupuncture. This is so important. I think that we need to look at acupuncture from a list of the conditions that we deal with in complementary alternative functional medicine. Acupuncture helps to move the stools and alleviate constipation. Clinical trials demonstrate that acupuncture relieves chronic constipation and produces greater long-term patient outcomes than drugs. I think that's fascinating. Massage, chiropractic, and osteopathic therapies are very important. And these practitioners can help with muscles and structure. So what if nothing works? Do not wait more than three days of no bowel movements. The longer stool is retained, the more dry and difficult. Retaining and withholding stools can lead to stretching of the colon, affecting signaling needed for peristalsis and elimination. So some people wait, and that waiting is what's going to make the problem worse. And there can be blockages in the colon that can come from urinary retention. There is a relationship because if the colon is bulging out, it can impede urine release. And if the urine is being retained in the bladder, that can press on the colon and create some blockages. So these are very important uh, items to know. Glycerin suppositories can trigger emptying of the bowel and they're less invasive than enemas and they're available for children and adults. Saline enemas, commercial or homemade. If none of this works, consider a rescue clean-out with Miralax. And I, I do not recommend this as a routine way of dealing with constipation. It's polyethylene glycol. It's not for continued regular use. This becomes the best choice when risking bowel blockages or obstructions which can be dangerous. So consult your physician for any chronic digestive problem. Now, just to look at the diet, special diets as needed. We've got at, at the core here the healthy diet. That's the first, a healthy organic diet. Then we look next 
usually, at gluten-free, casein, milk-free, soy-free. And we go on to the other diets based on how it fits the individual's needs. Now, here is the basic diet avoids. This is the healthy diet. Artificial sweeteners, additives, preservatives, toxins, high fructose corn syrup, and even agave because we cannot be sure it's organic. Diet and regular sodas and juice drinks, hydrogenated oils, trans fatty acids, margarines. These are one and the same, and they are mutant plastic fatty acids that have no role in human health. They are only detrimental. All deep fried foods, sugar and caffeine, refined grains, processed foods, crave foods, and any food that is a problem. If it does not grow, do not eat it. So we want nutrient-dense, eco-friendly, pasture-fed, grass-fed animals, eggs, seafood, meat, and poultry, beans, nuts, and seeds, homemade bone broths, pasture-fed, vegetables and fruits, fermented vegetables, fruits and beverages, whole ancient grains soaked, sprouted, and fermented, salted sea salt, filtered water, raw vegetable juices, and good fats and oils, extra virgin olive oil, butter, animal fats, coconut oil, expeller pressed, sesame flax oils. And natural sweeteners, we want to limit them, but honey, maple syrup, natural juices, stevia if it's organic, not commercial, And there are some references for that one. So gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free. The diet, no gluten's, wheat, oat, barley, rye, spelt, and kamut. No milk, casein, milk products, and soy. Underlying reasons for the diet are generally there can be many types of reactions to gluten from celiac to non-celiac gluten intolerance. So these individuals may not make enough of the enzyme DPP4, and they may have a leaky gut, which allows the gluten casein undigested opioids to be absorbed in the digestive tract and taken into the brain. The symptoms that suggest the diet may be helpful are obviously craving for gluten milk and or soy, GI constipation and diarrhea, poor eye contact and attention, Silly, dopey behavior, particularly after eating gluten, milk products, and even soy. Obsessive compulsive disorders, self-injury, stims, high pain tolerance. Why? Because the opioids have gotten to the brain. Recommendations and resources I've listed here, and I've put the importance of probiotics, biotin, demulsants. And let's look at the specific carbohydrate diet. What does it include? No disaccharides. Those are double sugars, lactose, sucrose, maltose, isomaltose. They're found in grains, beans, dried fruit, starches, and milk products. The underlying reasons for the diet is a deficiency in the enzymes, lactase, sucrase, maltase, isomaltase, and symptoms that suggest the diet may be helpful. Persistent gas, bloating, diarrhea, yeast overgrowth, symptoms worse when you can take in the foods. And a lot of parents will say, oh, the SCD and the GAPS diet helped my friend's child. I want to try it. When the child's not showing a reaction to these foods, the diet may not be helpful. And recommendations and resources, meat, fish, eggs, nuts, non-starch vegetables and fruits, disaccharidase enzymes, probiotics, biotin, celiac test, I put a question mark to make sure that's been tested, and breaking the vicious cycle on the SCD diet and the gapsdiet.com. Low oxalate diet. The, adi- the diet is to avoid nuts, beans, greens, and some grains, and fruits. What are the reasons for the diet? Oxalates are made in the body, in the gut, by fungi, and found in foods. Leaky gut allows absorption of the oxalates. Magnesium and B6 deficiency cause poor oxalate elimination. In symptoms that suggest the diet may be helpful, inflammation and pain persist, chronic bowel dysbiosis, 
regression after oxalate consumption, bedwetting sandy stools, and kidney stones. Recommendations are listed here. These are sites that you can go to. We use probiotics, biotin, magnesium, B6, and the active form, P5P, demulcents, vitamin A, and zinc. Rotation diets. This diet avoids repetition of foods that are based on food families for a four-day or seven-day rotation. The underlying reasons, multiple food reactions and poor digestion render complete avoidance too difficult. And this diet is helpful in that it, it gives a break to the digestive system and the body. Symptoms that suggest the diet may be helpful include multiple food reactions and few non-reactive foods, meaning the person is reacting to almost everything. Digestive and or immune problems persist, and the recommendations uh, are the rotation diet, probiotics, biotin, broad digestive enzymes, and Dr. Sally Rockwell has a site, and this is a wonderful site to develop the skill set for the rotation diet. So I'm just showing you here gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free choices in food groups. So here's the protein we need. We do not have to have all of these choices. We just have to have some of them. Animal source, seafood, meats, poultry, and eggs, but not the milk products that, that come from cows or animal sources. So animal source protein are foods with faces and foods that come from foods with faces. The plant source are fibers and beans, but not soy, nuts and seeds. And then we look at fats, saturated fatty acids. We make them in our body. And in the unsaturated fatty acids, the omega-9s are important. They're not uh, essential or required, but they're important. And this is Mediterranean oils, olive, but also avocado and almond oil. The polyunsaturates are omega-3 and omega-6, both essential. The Western diet is too heavily acts, is focused on omega-6, and that can suppress omega-3. And the omega-3 comes from beans, nuts and seeds, and seafood. And then we go to carbohydrates. We get our fiber here. Vegetables, fruits, grains, beans, nuts, and seeds, but no gluten in the grains and no soy in the beans. And this is what I call the square meal. It is designed for a gluten-free, casein-free, soy-free, organic meal. And it, this just summarizes what to avoid, what to include, and I've given the protein goals, fiber goals, and water goals as well. Healthy natural diet basics. The first food of the day sets the glucose standard for the day. The first drink of the day sets the glucose standard for the day. Have protein and fiber first. Protein, fiber, and good fat stabilize blood glucose control, mood, attention, and endurance. This is critical. I talk to people about getting breakfast right. You don't have, there are no breakfast police. You don't have to eat the standard um, high glycemic cereals, bagels, etc. Increase fiber if your digestive condition benefits. And that would be vegetables, fruits, nuts, and seeds, whole ancient grains. And guar gum can be added. Uh, it can be put into water. It can be put in your organic decaffeinated coffee or tea. And organic is more nutritious and reduces the load of harmful additives, pesticides, and chemicals. Low-fat and light foods are usually glycemic and can increase hunger, triglycerides, and weight. This is a summary chart that talks about calories, proteins, vegetables, fruits, grains, fiber, and water. If you notice on the grains, I put zero, two, three, zero to four, zero to five, zero to six, zero to seven, and zero to eight. We are not required to consume grains, milk products. They are options. They have only been in the human diet 
for the last 5,000 to 10,000 years. That's when we became domesticated. When you're looking at 200,000 to 400,000 of human life on Earth, this is a very short period of time. And the grains do not belong in a food group. They are part of carbohydrate choices. And beans were also not available until we figured out cooking because uncooked beans are very difficult. And this is just the book that Pam Compart and I uh, have written, the two books, the Kid Friendly ADHD and Autism Cookbook and the ADHD and Autism Nutritional Supplement Handbook. And these books are dedicated to the courageous children and to all who love and serve them. We are humbled in your presence. Uh, I'm happy to take some questions that you might have. Hi, Dana. Sorry, I was still unmuted, <laughs> but I'm, I'm here now. Yes, we've got a okay. lot of questions today, so I'll just dive right in. The first question we had was about aloe. So you spoke quite a bit about using aloe juice for supplementation. So a couple of things related to that. People want to know how young you can give that, like safety-wise, or if you just need to work with a doctor on that. And then the other question was whether capsules are sufficient if they're equal to using a liquid. The liquid seems to be better, and uh, it ha the juice is for swallowing. Uh, we don't want somebody getting a topical aloe to put on topically, and I've not used it in children. Um, I prefer to go with the safest, easiest, which is magnesium and probiotics. Okay. So the next question is about probiotics. Um, are there any risks for giving a higher level of CFUs than the recommended range listed um, on the on the labels of the packaging. So what's the philosophy about that, or who could you work with to determine the best levels? You know, this, that's a really good question, and um, I have a, a radio show called The Essentials of Healthy Living, and I just interviewed a doctor whose expertise is in probiotics. We were talking about probiotics for women's health, issues because there are unique strains for that, unique strains that are more beneficial for digestion and a whole other variety. And he brought up the fact that if you take too much, they can get in a battle and you may not get as much out of it. There's another opinion too, which is the body decides what it's going to do. You present the body with the opportunity to take in the probiotics and to use them. And I, I myself go by the patient. We start low, we increase. If increasing improves not just the stools, but any other symptoms, skin symptoms, mood symptoms, any other kind of symptom, then you're on the right path. And because we are so low in diversity, I think it's a good idea to jump around, to rotate different kinds of probiotics from excellent companies. There are many companies that manufacture excellent probiotics, and it's, it's tough to say this strain only does this, this strain only does that. It is a very complex issue, so each person's different. And I've had patients, I've had a few patients who can tolerate absolutely no probiotics, even what I call dot dosing, which is wetting the end of your finger and touching the powder with it. Um, we don't know why. <laughs> we, don't, we don't always have answers for some of the things that we see in our patients. Uh, I think you just have to go by your gut, pun intended, and what you're observing. Okay, I have a question here about omega-3s. So this person is yes. asking if those can be beneficial with constipation. I think you did touch on that, but maybe you could reiterate. And then also well, also about what the difference between 3s and 6s and what sources are for 3s. The 3s, the, the best source, are seafood or 
from the algae that the fish consume that gives the fish omega-3. And there are people who don't want to use fish or krill. Uh, krill oil is another good source, good marine source. Uh, beans, nuts, and seeds have the precursor, ALA, the precursor to omega-3. And many individuals are like cats. They don't make the conversion. So they won't do well with flax seeds uh, or ground flax seeds or flaxseed oil. And the one way to figure it out is to try. I mean, you get symptoms, skin symptoms, uh, cardiovascular, immune, vision symptoms, cognitive symptoms. Um, definitely we use omega-3. I didn't put it in there as, as one of the first things I think of with regard to constipation, I was trying to focus on the nutrients and the diets that may mean the most to an individual. And the, um, the omega-6s are from vegetables and uh, the, the vegetable oils. And we have used those abundantly. Corn oil was used for years and years. And what it did was suppress the omega-3, there's a balance here. Neither one are bad. It's a teeter-totter balance. If you can think of that teeter-totter being straight, we don't want it one-sided. Okay, and the benefit to the GI, does it, is it, does it have a healing effect? How does omega-3 benefit digestion? It does. It benefits. It's anti-inflammatory. So any inflammatory issue would be benefited by omega-3s. They have a broad benefit, not just uh, to inflammation. They, make, uh, they convert to at least 70 different hormones used in the body. They affect vision, immunity, cognition, brain structure, DHA, is important in brain structure, and they're important in, in uh, brain function, which is why they're very common as a supplement in those with autism. And we do see remarkable changes, not in everybody. <laughs> I, I wish we had something that was absolutely going to work for everybody who had autism as a diagnosis, but we don't have that. We have to taper it to the individual. Okay. Um, we've got time for just a couple more questions. The first one here is they were asking you, could you remind more about the choline supplement that you mentioned? Um, any specifics you can provide would be helpful. Uh, choline is, uh, I put phosphatidylcholine and there are other cholines. I've tended to favor the phosphatidylcholines and they are fairly abundant. Um, I have stayed away from the uh, choline. Some of the choline products have a little bit of ethanol in them, and it seems to be important for maintaining that particular choline. And so I've stayed away from that, even though it's a very tiny amount, um, and I may be being far too cautious with that. So you want to look up the phosphatidylcholine, and they, you know, they do have liquids and they do have gel caps. It's not the tastiest supplement, nor is carnitine. They're not tasty. So it's, you really have to try uh, to hide them if you have a person that cannot swallow the capsules. The GPC choline is also good. Uh, that's an excellent form of choline that can be used. And again, you start at the lower doses, and this helps cognition so much. It's, we really see that in autism, there is a higher need for choline. And I mentioned the Thanacol, which is a medicinal acetylcholine. It, it, it encourages acetylcholine, and it's certainly stronger than any of the supplements we, we have, and it has given some remarkable effects. I had a, a little boy in my office who had just come from Mary Megson the day before, and he was running to the bathroom and chatting up a storm. And this was a child who, who was verbal, but not this verbal. 
And I said, you need to call her and see what dose she wants you to reduce to because he was chatty. And the mother said, you know, it's just a pleasure to see him eliminating, even though he's going very frequently and he was getting on the edge of diarrhea, which is not a goal. And uh, he was he just could not stop talking. So I've actually seen the benefit. Uh, it can give a lot of side effects. And so I tend to stick uh, with the supplements. They may be a little slower in getting uh, that effect. They certainly aren't as strong as the medication. Okay, I think we've got time for just one more question. So this last question is about water filtration. Um, you had talked about different specs that you could use, and I think you, you had them in the slide, so people can review that when they go back and watch the playback. But I had some questions about specific, like is bottled Fiji water a good option? Are there bottled waters they should use, or is it preferable to use like an under-sink filtration system? What about those machines that you see at grocery stores? Well, the reverse osmosis is the most thorough. There is a lot of water waste with it, and um, that's usually more industrial. But there are households who use it, uh, and that way all the water in the household is going to be properly filtered. There are different filters that take out chlorine and fluoride. Those are hard to get out, and lead. Not all of them do, and that's why... I pointed everybody to the environmental working group. Um, I have under the sink uh, filters in my house, and I think they work well, and a shower filter. So that's worked well for us. And you can have your water tested. Uh, I know that Doctor's Data does that testing where you can take the water in your house from, let's say you've got it uh, under the sink, in the kitchen, take a sample of that, take a sample where you don't have a filter, and see the difference. That can guide you as what you need to do. But Environmental Working Group has done a fabulous job with regard to educating us on foods and toxins, filters, uh, products they have. You can uh, go on their uh, cosmetic and product uh, part of, of, of their site and put in the products you use, and you get a toxin level rating on that product. It's very educational. <laughs>